they are supposed to be here before quite some time ago. We have the time to tell you. Um, I, I, I've got a presentation today just to help me guide through my talks about what uh, I have with this uh, problem of uh, rambling off tangent. So I don't want to do that because everybody here wants to, wants to go and home with substance in, in what I talk about. Um, I'll try to do that. Um, and thank you for coming. I mean, I just want to know a show of hands. I think I saw the list of registration out there. Um, some do work for GLCs. Can I have a show of hands of people working for GLCs? Yeah, okay. Can I do? Okay, I could. Okay. Uh, uh, private sector big corporations, I can I saw some names over there. Boss Nationals? Yeah. Oh, we're in a good mix of both GLC students. Students? Oh, well, oh, thank you. And uh, what about SMEs? Running MCs themselves and so on? Yeah? Good, thank you. Well, I mean, I'm very delighted to see a good mix of all the types of uh, young professionals and so on. Thank you. Thanks. Hello? Can we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I have the next? Uh, I'm going to talk about what the future will be like because I, I do travel a lot, especially in ASEAN countries. We're expanding in study as a uh, e-business and e-government provider. Uh, we do open source uh, solutions. Uh, as you know, open source is free. Uh, so what we fundamentally do is that we take free software and we charge it to our clients. <laughs> fundamentally. But so of course, uh, you know, we put the services at the value add so that you don't have headache with open source. And you save a lot of cost compared to the likes of the other multinational companies. Now, we've seen this before. Uh, I think mean, everybody uh, knows this. The world's most competitive, uh, innovative companies in 2011 last year, right? I don't think they've come out with the report this yet. But you can see that number one is Apple. And last year it was uh, 2010, it was number three. Uh, Twitter uh, was is number two last year, but in 2010 it was number 50. Huge jump. But look at uh, Facebook, it dropped from number one to number three. Look at Instagram and Google. In 2010, it wasn't even in the radio screen. But they became the fourth innovative company and the fifth innovative company, Nissan and Group One. Next slide. What does this mean? Competition will be intense. Remember that in the car, the mirror is this, you know, you know, the object in the mirror is closer than you think. <laughs> well, it is. But sometimes it doesn't really appear until it sideswipes you. It is really intense right now. And I, you know, I run an IT company, and you know, competition is is tremendous when you don't realize the competition where it's coming from, and suddenly it appears. Malaysia will be extremely challenged within ASEAN, other ASEAN countries, and obviously China. Okay. Uh, traditional markets, people that we sell to, our good friends in the States, in Europe, you know, they can't afford as much as from us as before. Um, this will really impact our personal income. Because how do organizations, multinationals, SMEs, GLCs, afford to pay people, professionals like yourself, uh, how do entrepreneurs survive if these accounts, their earnings are deteriorated because of the global economy? How do we become a high income nation when the people that we are selling to can't really afford us anymore? And the people that, the things that we used to do, other countries and other people are doing it much more efficient and much cheaper than us. This is the questions that I keep asking myself. I know we have to spend of becoming a higher income nation. But the question I don't see how we're going to do this. Okay? 
I see it on the ground, I go to other countries, and I can't see, and I see a lot of people doing things a lot faster than we are. So I'm going to, that's a way I'm really going How do we produce a new generation of leaders? Everybody is in this room, I would say you are a friend, but you come here because you want to listen. But do we talk to some of our uh, contemporaries? Okay? People who are fresh and graduates, students are coming up. Do we talk to our colleagues? I talk to a lot of the youth and the younger generation in Indonesia in Vietnam. I call them first with them because IT is a very young industry. Okay? So the joke is that I'm an old man in the IT industry because of my gray head. But I tell them this is blonde, not gray. Okay? <laughs> so I dye my head blonde. Uh, but the thing is that the nexus of younger generation in Asia we should be worried about. Because we are spoken. We are cushioned. Okay? Things are great. Food is cheap. 24 hours a day, you can go train my time like a dime Okay? It's affordable still. You go back home to your parents, you've got your somebody to help you cook, and so on. Okay? We are actually very, very pampered. But the pampering will not be here for, for, for long because we will be really challenged by our way of life and how we do things. We are challenged by other countries and we are going to be asking. You know, things are going to be a lot different in the years, very short years to come. And my message to, to you guys is that we have to really wake up fast. Because if we don't, it's like that. You know what I'm from slowly the temperature increase until the only lesson and it's cooked. Okay? But we, we need a shock in the system okay, to really wake us up. Because the, when I talk to a lot of the youth out there, I'm concerned because they don't realize these things. They go and party, tweet, and Facebook, and so on. But they don't realize what's happening. And this is the thing that we're doing. And I see the Indonesians, I see the Vietnamese, I see the Thais. Uh, I see, you know, students coming up in, in Myanmar, how hungry they are compared to our uh, youth. I'm very concerned. Next slide, please. Let's make this well. 56% of GDP comes from services. What services? Banking, insurance. Okay? These are things that we sell to ourselves, right? Manufacturing, 28%. Things that we manufacture and export. Multinationals, people here from Manchester, they keep that money in themselves. They don't distribute it. The only thing that they distribute to multinationals is when they pay people salaries. But where does the money go is expected to be out. And, like I said, What's been manufactured here is corn. It's been manufactured in Vietnam, China. And obviously, the people that we were selling to traditionally don't really have that money anymore. Because they were being, they were actually borrowing money to buy the stuff from us. And now they can't pay themselves back or Well, they can't pay the, you know, the people they owe to, which is China and Japan. And probably us. I would not say the same as that. Well, that's part of it. Okay, we've got that. But you know, it's commodities, we know the experience in commodities. What happens? It fluctuates the price. When new things come up, what will happen in Palawan? Right? And we have other competition in Palawan. We have Indonesians and so on. And then there's the government. The government pumps the money to help the economy. Okay? Contractors get projects, infrastructure gets built, services have to be maintained, okay? It goes to organizations and entrepreneurs and SMEs, they pay people salaries. But we all know that the government is borrowing money 
to make sure the government operations are running. How long will that survive? Next time. Should be worried. I think we all should. Because we need to really ask ourselves where are we going from here? Malaysia is at really crossroads. We're talking about this um, middle income trap. We're like in the middle, stuck in between. We can't be low cost, we can't be, we can't be high innovation driven. So what do we do? What do we do? Next slide. One is attitude. I see a lot of people, well, I see CVs. I see young people coming to get jobs at, at Skadi and organizations. They have two years working experience and they switch to other jobs. We ask them why, well, experience and so on. We ask them again why is really for a higher pay. But do you get, are you worth the value of what you are getting paid? I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a business owner. If I pay somebody $1, I will only get $5 out of them. Okay? As an entrepreneur, that's what you do. Okay? As a business. And who you work for, they are asking the same thing too. You must create that value. Now, a lot of people job shit, job jobs because of how you pay. But, but I always ask, what can you learn in two years if you switch jobs all the time? You get comfortable, you get learned, you, you may become senior executive in that position, and you get offered a new job, okay, a higher pay, a new position, but in substance, do you have what it takes? Our shared experience in this study is that our first big break was 38, a customer that subscribed to us 38 million a month subscription. It was for a simple hosting service. Okay? And that customer was back in Okay? 38 million a month. One month. And I think I might have saved people have to do a service then. Uh, three or four times to go to their offices and so on, uh, their office. And probably I think they're parking is six million an hour. So I don't think we make money with today really a month. But if we had that lousy attitude saying that it's about money, we will never have that better than our customers. And following that, that we never liked our services. Okay? We were just providing a secondary hosting for that. The main website was hosted at that premises. After three or four months, that main website was coming coming down. What well, we switched to our data center to be hosted at us. And they put the same green in their office. They would charge them all. And they liked the value when they pulled the services up. After a while, we had millions of dollars of contracts with Ben Better. So that is about thing. You need to work at it. We need to work at the value before we ask the money from people. Before you ask for that job, say, I should be expected to pay the 5000 Ask yourself, what value have you created to claim and to ask for that salary a month for you? Do you have that substance? Because if you are on the salary yourself, people will be really disappointed. Because people pay you for that value. We're in a capitalistic world. Whatever people pay you is the value that they attach you. If you pay the Mercedes that's 400000 that's the value. But if you pay a program, 80000 that's the value of, it, of, of that asset that you have. We live in a capitalistic world. So this is the rules of the game. So are you worth that salary that you are getting paid? Is that experience that you work, the knowledge, the network that you have built, is enough to earn that? Money. If not, be realistic. Because the guy in Vietnam, the guy in Indonesia, they will be a lot cheaper than you. So you must provide that value. Okay? Thank God the Indonesians and the Thais and the Vietnamese don't know English as much as we do. But when they do know English, okay? When they can sell the masala, 
Okay? With the Pineapple for sale. Okay? That is when we should be really good. I have this in my team at Scully. Everybody is stuck in their comfort zone. Okay? Now, is that going for a stress test, your fitness stress test? I asked the doctor, who invented the stress test for your heart? Because it's really tiring. Right? And that's the purpose, to see how far you can go before you collapse. So you, and who's going for a stress test? Everybody's young. Nobody's going for a stress test here, bro. Except for me. <laughs> okay? Well, stress test is very simple. Do it, they, they, they put a whole bunch of things on your chest. If you have a heavy chest, and after that. Okay? So shave before that. Uh, but they put everything in there to monitor your heart. And then you go on the treadmill. First thing is easy. You feel macho. Very good, no problem, and then they keep increasing the the uh, intensity, the speed, and also the height of the treadmill until you get oh god, this is tiring. And they go by stages. The higher the stage, that's how fitness you are, how fit you are. So if you take a lot of technique, and my good friend right here, yeah, and Nasi Kanda, which my friend just invited me after this, we go over Nasi Kanda and we start. <laughs> We're not going to survive stage 3. <laughs> to be honest with you, okay? So, uh, you know, that is how you must stress yourself. And as younger people, people, the other day I had, this, I had a discussion with a CEO, and he said that, he, you know, there's this bright chap in, in his organization, and he said it's brilliant. Three days, very vocal, very open-minded, versatile. He gave a new assignment to this young guy. But this young guy rejected. Why? Because he was scared. He was scared of exposure, scared of this new thing. It's not really that new, but he was scared. He was comfortable with doing what he wants to do. And that's it. Okay? We must challenge ourselves because if you do not know what you can do beyond your comfort zone, you will never know yourself. And it's like that stress test. If I didn't go into stress test, I wouldn't know how lousy my heart is pumping. Okay? So after that, it's quick and I have to reject all the messy come down, which I like. Okay? So, you wouldn't know. So you need to push yourself and a lot of our youth don't push ourselves. And I go to Indonesia, okay? I don't go to Indonesia to, to, to the big offices. I follow my wife who does, who's an entrepreneur. And he, she buys things in Indonesia and sells them over here on Facebook and so on. So I carry the bags for her. <laughs> okay? So I go to Monday Bureau. I go to all these places. And I see how hardworking the Indonesians are. How much they have to carry on their bags to transport yeah, from the factory to where the retail shops are. And these are shop owners. Do we have shop owners in Malaysia like that? No, who's doing our job? The Bangladesh or the Indonesians. But do we sweat? Have we lost our work ethics of working hard? and you know, pushing ourselves like we used to. Because we are concerned because maybe we have forgotten that. Next time. <coughs> Do you have balls? Obviously I can't put balls, no balls here. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to do rock balls, soccer balls, basketball balls, basketball balls. So you need to have the courage you need to know that if you are not brave enough to do whatever you want to do. So the question is that, what's the greatest thing that we have done? I know sometimes we go out, we jump off our plane to, yeah, we, you know, go to Taman Zayo, which I just did, which was scary. Okay. But it was fun. Yeah. My, my 
Anda ini saya satu, ya, saya hand, he he bawa as hand, he is very experienced guy, so he can assist. Uh, but you know, me and my wife man, we're talking about teachers and everything. Uh, but it was fine, but you know, we are not comfortable and try to get the courage to do it. Uh, because we want to experience new things. But this is how it go. I started scanning the rock because I was forced to start scanning. Okay? I started scanning because we got fed up as being nature makers to see how we can shuffle a few pieces of paper and make somebody rich. Uh, you know? And, you know, we, we were tired of uh, privatizing government assets and, and giving it to somebody and said, hey, immediately you were millionaires and millionaires. We said, what's the value in that? Where is the innovation? And at that time, the IT was coming out, the dot com was coming in, People were talking about innovation and so on, and we said we want to start a company. So beyond that, our fat paying jobs and our expense account, uh, we were under the as in Raza and Chiang I think we were also tired of it was in as well. <laughs> and uh, we all that, and we were, I think he's a good boss, he trained us well, and he gave his blessings, and he supported us. Uh, to start a new company and we started this kind of thing. We didn't know anything about IT. The, the most that I did about IT was when I did some simple flight simulator programming at the age of nine years old. <laughs> okay? And I was fixated with programming at the age of nine until I reached 13 and found out about girls. <laughs> yeah. Okay? So, you know, that's all we're getting at it. And then the other thing was that I was the most junior at CIMB Corporate Finance. They would down me with all the mediocre stuff to be done. And some of them, I did not know why, but when I went to school, they, they taught me how to type. So I can type very fast, faster than the secretaries, without looking at the keyboard. Okay? And look at that. Did you still teach that? No. I'm not really sure. But you know, the, you know, the hard typing like do do do. Okay, but they taught me. I can I can type thirty six words per minute. Okay, and uh, so all the typing was done by me. All the word processing was done by me, even though I'm just an executive. Okay, that time word processing, well, there's no Microsoft word. They use Microsoft uh, word processing that time. Who remembers word processing? One, two, go, go. <laughs> um, well, look at that. It was, it was really amazing. You know the drag and draw where you can put boxes in Microsoft Word? You can drag from one corner to that. Do you know that in WordPress that last time you had to code it and you had to put the dashes properly and so on? It's how difficult WordPress that was. Well, because I know that thing, they asked me because the, the, the secretaries have too many, too many reports. And, and you know cut and paste yes. in Microsoft Word? Yes. You know what we do when corporate finance in 1990s? We actually cut and paste. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> we cut the old report, okay? Because it's standard by most prospectuses. And then we actually staple in the new report and cancel the the, the company names. So it's like Faber, you can say like Ping Ping. It's the same kind of thing. It's actually that. You can actually do that. Okay, that's how backwards the IT was. Uh, and, and, you know, I had to do that. And I learned a lot. And the thing is that, uh, and then uh, PowerPoint came out. You know, Bill Gates came with PowerPoint. And uh, you know the transparencies, I don't know if you have it, but the transparency is clear color, you put it over the overhead projector, you close it and open it, and, and it comes out. Well, that's what we used to have, and we had a computer, and we figured it out, and soon I was doing, I was doing basically PowerPoint presentations for everybody in the company. So these are things that I was doing, and so on. I wasn't afraid of, of not 
of, of doing, of not doing these things. Because probably if I was the most junior, I was probably being bullied uh, and was given everything to be done. But I learned a lot. And I learned a staff in Scandi who learned a lot because he took the volunteer to actually do that. He learned how to do sales, he learned how to do programming. Either. And he's probably one of the whole management leaders right now because he's so versatile, he can do a lot of things. But I see a lot of my staff, a lot of young generation, they're stuck and they're scared of doing these things. And failure is something that we are all scared of. But we have to learn that failure is actually a process. It's not. You have to fail to learn. So don't be scared of failing to make mistakes. Next slide. Right? What's your value? Let's go. I talk about Nasikanda because I, I like to go to Nasikanda. Our office used to be in Nasikanda, Peter, and Pani. And uh, why I moved there was because our office was in UPN and our meetings were in KLCC. And we were mostly stuck in KLCC at Nasikanda. So he said, oh, we're going to put an office in there. Everybody's health deteriorated. <laughs> I had one programmer, he can use his tummy as a table. <laughs> he can put a laptop and tummy in a table. It's <laughs> huh? amazing. Huh? But that was after huh, three months eating nasi kanda. Huh? <laughs> but let's, let's be simple, let's be straightforward. What is the value of nasi kanda? Anybody? Give me one value of nasi kanda. Huh? Delicious. Right? Mama. Mama food. Well, what's, what's so special about mama food? Why not go to McDonald's or go to, go to you know, another place? Curry. Why not stay home? Yes. Curry. <laughs> okay? Kua <laughs> Chang But, okay, and I think it's relatively clean, right? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but the video gets more the better the food is, right? <laughs> but, and it's cheap. Yeah, <laughs> okay, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what is it kind of, I remember, it cost me 15 years. <laughs> so expensive. You know, that's a good thing, it's kind of, I put a prawn and everything there, but it's expensive. Okay, but I still paid for it. But they had value when they realized that value. Here's the question, do we know what's our value? Individually. Do you know what's your department's value? Do you know your organization's value? Do we know our country's value? And once you know that value, because it sounds harder than, than I say it, because sometimes we do not know what our value is. Okay, and we go by every day and doing everything that we do every day, and we never realize what our value is. But do we know? But once you know your value, that's when you know your competitive edge. And that's where you actually know what you what you're worth. Okay? So that's came okay, 19th century, still here. You go to India, what that do this and now? <laughs> okay? Next. Asia, where will, where will we be? <laughs> Indonesia, 250 million. Philippines, 96 million. Okay, I, I didn't know that this is this big until you know, I did this presentation. Thank God for Wikipedia. Vietnam, <laughs> uh, 90 million. Thailand, 70 million. Myanmar, 49 million. Malaysia, kecil je, 29 million. Kecil je. Probably 4 million is from the other countries as well. <laughs> so we already have 25 million. Okay? How much more? Like I said, just imagine these people wake up. Some of the governments are not in order yet. Myanmar just came out from military uh, rule. It's a democracy. Okay? Thailand has got the yellow and red. I don't know what the colors they have. 
But you know they're going to sort things out. Indonesia is not one country, it's like five countries in one. <laughs> do business there, you know, but you know that's how it is. But I tell you, be afraid, be really afraid. Okay? Vietnam, 20% of the GDP comes from IT, a lot better than Asia. To, to, for the IT industry in Malaysia. They are exporting, and I go there, they have like IT companies where they say, well, you're from Malaysia, please go to this section. They say, why? Oh, because we, uh, those people speak English, you can convince them. What other sections do we have? Oh, we have the Korean, Japanese, and other sections also. We have Thai section. Why? Oh, because we do customers there, they speak Thai, they speak Korean, they speak Japanese. This is Vietnam, no. I look at it and say, I feel so mad. Okay, we must be better. But where are we? Soon we'll be dwarfed. Remember, in the 1940s, who was the leading economy in Asia? Well, it's Myanmar and Philippines, where are they now? How 20 years ago? Data, where will we be? When these economies and where their political infrastructure and the social structure will be in place, where will we be? Next. <coughs> well, we got something, right? We got a stable government. Yes, election is coming. So, okay? Fine, right, election is coming. People will leave them You all right? What? It's very true. I, I, you know, they say they are, they are, they are the progress is to preserve order and make change and to, and to preserve change and make order. Do we have order within change and change within order in our system? I think we do. I think, okay, I'll be honest because of my last name, uh, you know, uh, I'm, and I'm more than a BN person. I don't think I can change anything by the trust. Flash and black. I think I'm probably disowned by my father if I say political party. Uh, but yeah, you know, I probably have uh, auto review every year for Amnon membership, probably me. Yeah. But the thing is that I speak to a lot of the Amnon people, and also the opposition because I'm glad that right? So, you know, you always have relatives and friends on both sides. And uh, you know, we, we, we actually realize is that if the opposition comes into, will it be like Taliban rule in Malaysia? Will we be preaching a little Latomini style? Okay? Do we go to Marxism and so on? No. I don't think it will be like that. And I think we will have progress between change and change with the progress. It's going in. We've got a very stable institution. And I don't think, you know, okay, we do go march on the streets once in a while, okay, but I don't think it's airports closing down like in Thailand and so on. Everywhere I go in ASEAN countries, everybody has respect about conditions. We are competitive, we are basically open, we are versatile. Okay? We have relations everywhere in different countries. I go to any country, I can find a Malaysian restaurant. Chinese mission Masa Uti Chanai. Okay? And everybody knows that Malaysians are very versatile. We, we can dialogue with people and so on. And that is another aspect, asset that we have. I have We've spoken to Indonesians, I've spoken to Thais and Vietnamese. Because of their history, probably where they come from, they are not as open as Malaysians are. And we should ride on that strength. In fact, a lawyer friend told me that every time, okay, any big decisions are going to be done, big projects being done by any of the Asian countries, 
who do they send? From the PWCs, the UNS, EY, and so on. They actually send the Indonesian team. Okay, if you go to Indonesia, we can speak Bahrainish, we can speak Mandarin, we are love versus in English, we know common law, our agreements and documentations are very good, counting uh, standards are structured and well versed. We know all that stuff. It's always the Malaysian team that goes. That's how good we are. And we have to realize that. And that's one value we have. Big savings. Because everybody is forced to save. EPF and DMB, we have a lot of capital actually. I didn't realize this, but we do have a lot of capital. Okay? And right now, what are we doing? We are buying property in the UK, buying the uh, property in Europe, the US, and Australia, looking for affordable assets. We are taking advantage of the economic situation in those countries. We've got a good infrastructure. The other day, two weeks ago, I was at Davis College, and I said one of the people I admire is Sami Delhi. You go, huh? What? You know, people say, don't worry. Not only people like you put the Mahade, the Najib, the why Sami Delhi? Well, I'll tell you, I've been to other countries. Our roads are a lot better than this. And if it wasn't for some event with privatization and so on, I don't think we'll get the roads. I know we have to pay toll, touch and go and all that, but it beats the jam, right? But our roads are a lot better. And this is one of the things that I admire about Malaysia. Everybody comes over here, they go, wow. I go to Saudi, the roads are not as good as ours. Infrastructure is not in place. Okay? So, be proud of that. And we, sometimes we take things for granted, we complain. But you know, my staff in Indonesia takes four hours to go back to the home from our office. Four hours sitting in a car. <laughs> okay, and I buy the meeting at 8 o'clock in town. She has to leave at 4 o'clock in the morning and arrive in, in the meeting at 6 o'clock and she sleeps first outside the meeting and then come to the meeting at 8. That's how bad things are. Infrastructure and goods. So we do have things. Let's, let's realize our advantage. And we've got a lot of things. Thank you. <coughs> That's it. So that ends my uh, speech or dialogue session. We got my Twitter. My MP is full. I'm trying to 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 actually uh, reduce or I don't know. Sometimes I just add and accept all my friends thing, and then that's what happens. Uh, so slowly I'm trying to uh, get new some sort of people don't even talk to me anymore. Um, so we have Twitter and Scully's uh, Facebook. So do add us over there and, and follow us. Um, um, sometimes I get too much and it takes time for me to reply, but I will reply within this year. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you put the thing that we've got big business like 10 million ringgit, I'm replying to you. <laughs> Okay, but uh, thank you very much. In, in, in summary, remember, uh, Malaysia is in a very critical period. And you guys here, because you know most of you have black hair rather than white hair like me, you, we, we stand on you. Okay? And what's going to happen is that things are going to be a lot tougher. You have to realize that. Um, good luck for you because it was a lot easier for me. But it's a lot tougher for you guys. Okay? But the thing is that we have a lot of things inside Malaysia. And we have to realize this. And one of the things is that, you know, we've got countries next to us that's really big and needs our expertise, our experience, our knowledge, and even the, the, the lessons that we learn from our mistakes. We must go there and show our value. Okay? Because if we don't, other people will. And we've lost a lot of opportunities because we are this way. You know? uh, do the things that you need to do. Don't be scared. 
go over there in Thailand and put your store, become an intern, work the company there. Okay? Sawadi Kap, Sawadi Kap. Okay? Go to Indonesia, go to Myanmar, okay? experience the life of a Burmese family. Learn, build a network. I have a diplomat son that I met for breakfast today. And he is 16 years old, okay, finishing school and going to university in Indonesia and he's going to stay there in Indonesia because he wants to build a network and relationship business in Indonesia because he knows it's going to be big. And I said, good on you because we need more Malaysians like that. We need Malaysians to be our. Because look at our life, look at our history. We went to the frontiers at the end of the earth, see? Malaysians are all the way in Sri Lanka. Okay? Malaysians are all the way in Christmas Island. Far, far away. Yeah? Our, our, our DNA is probably the same people as the Hawaiians because we won't need to sail as far as that. So we must remember, okay, that we have gone and explored the far reaches and we have to do the same. Thank you very much. for the uh, lovely speech and we shall now move on to the question and answer Q&A session. Uh, we will take maybe two to three questions in one go and back to the speaker. Okay, for the first question. Uh, uh, thanks for the speech. I just I'm just trying to shift gears, right? Okay. I'm just trying to understand the company and the industry better. Um, I should probably have done my promo before coming. I'm trying to understand what Scar is. And which I just got on the internet for the past few minutes. Um, I have a few questions for you. The first question is um, I, I was on the internet, you know, going to Scarly's site and I believe that you guys are doing everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. from web hosting to content to human capital development. So what is actually SCALI doing? Just trying to understand the company better. Um, the second question is, you're talking a lot about value, which I really believe in. Um, when you started the company of SCALI, you know, it was a new startup, how do you actually create value to actually procure the government um, contracts? I, I think you said something about e-government. You know, it's a huge governmental and really small player in the industry. So that's my second question. And my third question is just trying to understand the sort of the IT industry better. I believe that you know, Scali is in the IT industry. So what are the you know who are the competitors, what are the challenges that you guys are facing? I, I believe that the huge companies have scaled up tremendously for the past you know, decade or probably the past few years. Um, and what are the solutions that you guys are proposing or what you guys have done in the past few years or the past two months or the past few days? Um, so that those are three my, my three questions to summarize again is what is Scali? Um, how do you manage to get the government contract to create value for SCADI. And the third is the IT industry. So just a brief overview on the IT industry in general. Try to make some solutions, thanks. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I didn't really want to talk about SCADI as much because we, we have a policy in SCADI not to sell ourselves in you know, talks like this. You know. uh, but thank you for helping me to sell. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, SCADI, uh, well, we max. Uh, we help organizations use the web more effectively, uh, the internet. Uh, we build solutions uh, for you guys, uh, for organizations, so that you can manage your processes, increase your revenue, and reduce your cost. Uh, we believe in open source technology, so we have the software, the platform for that for you to build your web-based solutions, and we have the data center infrastructure. And we've uh, recently introduced the cloud, 
which is growing very fast uh, for us. Um, now the question is about the government. You know, surprisingly, the Sky first business wasn't in the government. Um, we were a search engine portal. We ran lots of this stuff uh, for Asia, ex Japan. They excluded Japan because we can't speak Japanese. So we handled AutoVista search engine. Um, I don't think people remember AutoVista. AutoVista is not Asta La Vista. No more. <laughs> uh, before Yahoo, before Google, before Bing, there was AutoVista search engine. The, worst, the world's populous, uh, popular, uh, most popular search engine. Okay? And we actually ran for the whole of Asia. Um, it cost a lot. Uh, to do, uh, and you know, I was very worried uh, because we had to borrow a lot of money. But uh, we did it, and, and so on. But uh, our clients were like Intel, Motorola, and so on. And uh, only in 2002, uh, we built uh, because when we started out of this, we had to run a portal. And at that time, uh, there weren't any what we call a content management system to run portals. You know, now you have Joomla, WordPress, and all that, all that stuff. It's cheap and it's free. But at that time, there wasn't. So we went to Microsoft and they said, oh, you know, we've got this technology, it's brilliant, it's going to cost you 20 million ringgit. And then we said, of course, yeah, we have to look much more. We said, oh, yeah, 20 million ringgit, doable, we'll go back and we'll scratch your head, how do you get 20 million ringgit? So we went to IBM. The cheapest we could find for that type of technology was four million. Still, we didn't have four million. So there was two entrepreneurs. Uh, one, one, one entrepreneur name was Magat. The other one's Ivan. Uh, so we said, look, you can develop the CMS platform, and we'll do the marketing. We'll split the revenue 50-50. They like it because it's just two of them. And the programmers, they don't have overheads. We like it because we don't have to hire programmers because we didn't know anything about that at that time. And we started the business. And there was an EPF tender. EPF uh, wanted to revamp their website to allow people to check and update their status EPF uh, records. Because all the counters were swamped with people going there just checking updates and records. Or did my employer deposit my EPF uh, uh, payment amount? And it was just it was just too cumbersome for EPF. So they wanted to do that online. Deal. We didn't know about the tender until so somebody told us, hey, you should submit this because you have that technology and you it's proven. And they said, okay. So we submitted. And we didn't think we were going to win. And that was our first government project. We, honestly, we said we can't be bothered with it. We just submitted for, for the sake of something. And they called us for uh, shortlisting. They shortlisted us and they called us for clarification. And they said, hey, okay, then we got a chance, right? Yeah. So they came in and they asked us, your technology that you've proposed, this open source technology and so on, show me it's proven. So we showed them the portal and the search engine that we did. It's done. How many transactions? Well, we do about a million transactions and page views a day. Oh, it works. What's your infrastructure? We show our small data center and so on with expensive uh, servers. Oh, it does work. And then they go, is your price correct? I said, what's wrong with the price? And I, screwed. I was like, was really good. And I was looking and giving an evil eye to my sales guy and said, you missed a zero or something in the quotation? <laughs> Zero, we put it correctly, right? Because our price was around four million. Uh, it was a big, massive project, a lot of servers and so on. But uh, you know, it's about a six months uh, project to do what we call an enterprise portal. They said, yeah, yeah, the price is correct. And then you go, did you miss a zero in your quotation? <laughs> no, it's four million. You mean your price is four million? Yeah. Well, your nearest competitor, his price was 28 million. So how can you do it for 4 million? Huh? And then we said, oh damn, we price too cheap. <laughs> <laughs> but 
they saw the value and said, four million is young kids at the time is young. And uh, you know, we can do this and we proved that. But they weren't convinced. They said, look, uh, if, it, if you're serious and you think that you can do it, um, okay, you do it first. And if you don't like it, we won't pay. If we like it only, then we will pay. And we will pay over six months. I said, oh, lah, mah, ni PM, berapa juta, billion duit nak bayar di enam bulan lah, lah. Okay. <laughs> Tapi I said, okay lah, because I said, this is the first big project. This is our first million dollar project. At the time, we were doing 100,000, 50,000 ringgit. This is our first big project. And then I said, I said, okay. I, I look on my right, my CFO fell off her seat already. <laughs> I, she was thinking, how are we going to finance this project? But we did. And that was our first project. And we went on and on like this because we know when it comes to e-government, they needed a portal because that's the first line of interacting to the citizens. And look at us around here. We're all young. Do we grow to count government counters anymore? No, right? It's all the internet. And the government has to be pushed by the citizens to go on the internet. And we were there because we were the first one to do it. We, but, we didn't, but we didn't do it using other people's technology. We did it using our technology. We took open source technology. We developed it our own. And obviously, with open source, you can't charge licensing. We charge services. And every time we go in, we're about 50% cheaper than the next counterpart. That creates value. Now, where does that 50% go? Well, the savings go in people's training. It goes into building new systems. It goes into change management. That is more worthwhile than paying multinationals big software licensing. And that's what we have done. We saved a lot of costs for the government. And we saved a lot of costs for our customers. To the point that, you know, certain organizations, they are totally open source because of us. And we had a lot of uh, 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 hesitations and a lot of political, not political, a lot of what we call uh, barricades to stop us. Uh, we, we didn't say no, we carried on and said Look, this is the value, it's proven technology, not just by us, but you know, the great thing about open source technology, everybody in the world is using it. So it was an easy sell, and the price was easy, and that's how it is. Third about the IT industry, well, uh, don't ask me because we, I'm in the middle of it, okay? Um, and it changes all the time. It's scary how it changes all the time. Um, you just have to change all the time, that's it. And you have to learn new technology. Now we used to build on top, I mean, um, you sound like a techie person, so we used to build on PHP. Okay, now we're building on Java because we want to hit the big guys enterprise level. If we don't hit them, the multinationals will, will, will capture the opportunity. So we gotta go and capture the opportunity. But it, it had to, we had to change a lot of things. And there was technologies that we invested that totally, out of one year later, it became obsolete. And that's the price of IT and how fast things change. And it's scary, but this is the nature of things in the industry right now. So if the answer to your question is that where the IT is going, well, things are changing very fast. It's really coping up and being the next wave, of taking that opportunity as an entrepreneur. That's what I, we do, and that's what I do, and putting value to the customers. That's, I think that's the essence of where the IT industry is going. As for workforce, we don't have enough. I, I think I've, I've said this repeatedly. We must ride on the Asian countries in terms of our infrastructure, of, in terms of people and capability, and the market and even capital. We have to go globally to, to build our IT industry. Thanks. Good evening, guys. Now, before I post the question, I'd like to introduce myself again. I'm uh, Mustafa Ong. So if you can uh, hit on Google, so you get everything on me, my family. But uh, to go, you have done very well. I can recall that over the last uh, 17 years, right? 
15. 15 years when you were the pioneer in MSC. That's where I was. And I lived here on Latin Sharifah. And uh, I recall that one day I stepped into the office, you would not see me. And I was surprised that just a few, two or three chaps from the whole office in Ukraine. Because at that time I was in corporate, uh, from admin to corporate, trying to revamp uh, after the time from government foreign service. So they put me in the corporate sector. And I was very fortunate. One week on leave, you know, I was called to uh, see the lead chairman and see you. Because MSC started in uh, 2006, so they were lack of experience and uh, manpower. But, I, but uh, being an old, old man with so many hats in my 37 years of 34 years of service, home and abroad, the government has uh, decided that uh, I could be useful in, in, in MSC. So I started. And after one year, I was moved to corporate. Why? Because we needed to sell MSC. So that's why Sky came in. And many others, the pilots in MSC. But I think Tunku and Skadi is uh, synonymous. He's done so well. You know, we are family, connected in crime time. And uh, I think uh, YCM is one of my toy. I am on the list of uh, invitations. And I try to make it because I'm also busy. Tunku raised the question no. I mean, I'm no man. I'm no man for so long, since 1964. And so now, I've never jumped ship at whatever cost. And you can read what I wrote in my own blog. I'm also a blogger. But I don't like to uh, talk so much about myself. But I think tonight's program, we are very fortunate to have Tengu. And he's given you a, a very, uh, uh, you know, rundown on what he did and all that. That was very, very impressive for a small startup company 15 years ago. And he has achieved it. Now, if Tunku can achieve it, I'm sure you punch with your experience, your qualification into new business as advisor. Go overseas. Forget about Malaysia. We have the talent call, right? We get back those Malaysians who are good and come back. But it is not working well in the uh, talent call. We all know. We pump in a lot of uh, money, but the return is uh, not very encouraging. But what Tunku is trying to say is move out from your comfort zone in Malaysia and see the other country uh, the list there. Then you will know how to do business. And after five, seven years or ten years, you come back to Malaysia and help this country. Right? Don't play politics. If you are not a politician, don't play politics. But please, I'm not a politician. In and out. The question is here, I would like to pose to Tunku, apart from giving some encouragement encouragement to youngsters like you. Tengu, a very important question. I was interviewed by Business FM. If you know about Business FM, by last night. And I was interviewed about two weeks ago and when we initially came back last night, for after one week, and I switched on my, uh, my, my computer, and that was the radio program, and uh, I could hear my own voice. Very interesting, Business FM. It's under ideas. How many of you are familiar with ideas? What's the idea? It's a think tank, right? Think tank, and uh, I think our Nadri Similan Tengku. Tengku Nera? Not this man. Tengku Nera is involved. But anyway, the question here, uh, Tengku, is that now, with your experience and you've done so well, a lot of corporate leaders you know, have been asking, and my son is one of them. And uh, the question here is how much, in your opinion, do you think that the government should get involved in business, given the present political scenario? I'm comparing this to Singapore. Singapore, fantastic. They have so many GLC and GLC in Singapore, they are really, really doing that. They started government involvement when I was in Vietnam, my first posting in Vietnam. We have Singapore in Chaco. That is a platform for Singapore uh, government into the business, in Singapore as well as Overseas, they use in Chaco. So the question to you is, how much, in your opinion, you think our present government, which is still the end, I hope so, after PR it is still the end, get involved in some business. That means the GLC, the whatever you have in mind. But tell, tell us, and tell the audience, how much should the government involve or should not involve in business, given the political situation? This very important question. 
as we move on to PR 13. So give us a frank opinion, right? Thinking of the Bolivia and Malay participation in our economy, which is very small. Uh, thank you, Dato. Uh, I think now we should open the uh, other questions okay, to, I, I, to, to the uh, voice CMS. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll stop from there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening, sir. I'm uh, so three question here. Yeah? Sorry, um, sorry. I also three question here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ah, I'm sure. Yes, you right. right. The first question is, um, I'm actually in the middle of uh, what you call this career transition or whatever you call it, jobs. <laughs> right. I quit. I quit my uh, last job. It was uh, paying well and I was doing okay, but I was frustrated because I want to innovate. In Many ways, I want to do things differently. I want to add values in things I do. But employers or my superiors or whatever you call it, they usually don't want. They want to be in their comfort zone and do things the way they are because um, it works. And I mean, why spend more, more time in creating troubles? So my, my question here is that as uh, we all know that you pose a very uh, important question that we need to innovate in order to compete and all. But how do we do this as in wherever I, I, I'm in the difficulty of finding a good employer to allow employees to innovate? Um, that's also one thing, one thing. That, that, that is one thing. And also under the big environment with this kind of uh, policies and uh, structure that we are in, we have a lot of, I mean, you can just play this way. We can earn money easily by having connection and not having the need to innovate as a business. So in a big like in, a, in, a, in a greater level, as a business, you don't need to innovate to earn money. So how do we do that? And in a smaller scale, as an employee and as a boss, I mean, a lot of bosses do business without having I mean, innovate. I mean, if I cannot survive, I just use my money capital, I do have a kind of business. So then, my like, first question. My right, second question would be, um, innovation usually come, come, from, come a lot from a small company, SME and all those. Those are not big, 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 big company. So, uh, can you can you tell us more about how you managed to uh, bring this startup to what it is now? As in, uh, what you need? Do you need a lot of connection? Do you need to be very knowledgeable? Do you need to have like uh, people to get finance and what 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 you need to 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 be able to get the startup and get it successful? So this is my second question. My third question is, uh, I would like to know more about uh, your experience in traveling to other Asian country, country like Indonesia and all. Because even though we are connected Facebook and all, our, our Facebook, all the friends in our, our Facebook are all around us. So we have to know more about both uh, supply and demand side, as in, if you talk about people there, they are hardworking, but how, how, how fast do you think they can catch up with us, as in, are they smarter? Are they, are they, how, how are they? Are they Will they be like us once they get into middle income, they will be comfortable and uh, what? I mean, yeah, and this is for the demand side, sorry, for the supply side. For the demand side, how, how is the customer there? How is the bosses there? How is the business? How, is, how different are they? are they? So these are my three questions. So uh, let me just recap. My first question is uh, on uh, uh, innovative innovation. How do you manage to do innovation? Uh, big level as, in, as a business and as an individual. Second question is, uh, what is my second question? <laughs> my second question was, uh, oh yeah, my second question was on startup. How do you do a successful startup? My third question was uh, Asian, Asian experience, supply and demand side. So do, 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 you, do you remember my question? <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I, I'm going to ask uh, uh, that was with uh, um, answer those before I forget it. Yeah. <laughs> I think I've got in three questions. But about about government sector, I believe in government sector in stimulating the economy. Uh, I believe in, in developing industries like IT and so on. Um, like for example, the training of uh, unemployed graduates, training and skills and so on, having HRDF funds. To, to, to retrain our people, I believe in that. But there are certain times when the government does compete, even with us, 
and we feel that it's really unfair competition. So there'll be a certain level where the government needs to reduce this their involvement because it does crowd out a lot of things. I've lost some good people to GLCs, and I don't have any offence to any GLCs. Uh, and some of my good friends and my relatives are in GLCs, but they take the good people in, and it's hard for me to compete as an as a entrepreneur company, as a start, as as a private sector company. Uh, non GLC to offer that kind of benefits to the staff. Uh, so it's very hard. So in terms of competition of uh, of manpower, these are the things where the government can in fact uh, diminish uh, competitive strengths of local companies. So they, they need to know when to step back. And some sectors is totally dependent on government. There is no private sector uh, strong private companies that can be established inside that sector because of the presence of the government. And, and we have to restructure, re-look at how we do business in the industry. Now, going back to your question, I'm sorry, what's your name? Chun, Chun, I'm sorry. Okay, first question, uh, innovation. Uh, people mistake innovation as something grand, something rocket science, it's not. In innovation is something useful out of an invention. That's it. Useful. Useful means value. Now, we teach uh, entrepreneurship to 2,200 apprentices in, in, in our company. We take 200 apprentices every year, and we teach entrepreneurship leadership. And one of the case studies, as the first week of our class, is visiting uh, Old Burger. Anybody live in Ampara? Yeah? You know old burger in front of 7-Eleven, Now that guy has been around for 20, 30 years selling burger. Now if he's not innovative, he wouldn't be for 20, 30 years. Okay? One time, he was missing for two months. Up to a level when people were going crazy and upset because he's missing for two months. <laughs> because he couldn't get any burgers. <laughs> Okay? It's delicious, it's not really healthy, it's really swampy and a lot of grease, but it's delicious. Okay? And people were upset because he was missing two months. And he showed up and I said, Pachi, where, where were you for two months? I couldn't get my burger. Oh, sorry, they, uh, I, I went for Umrah with uh, my wife. Wow, oh, two months, stay in Umrah. It's, uh, you were doing some business? No, Umrah, how do you relax? So you must learn a lot. Yeah. I think he's always buying with him. And I was studying him. So I always go back and ask, ask him questions. And I want to learn. Why how can this guy survive for so long? Right? And his his and I ask him, what's his two innovation? He said simple. Right? And he, you see, one time I opened he opened the at night up. Yeah. I opened around 10 30 up to 4 o'clock in the morning. So that means I, I hit a different crowd. You see all those people open at around 2 o'clock and close at 5? How many burger stores are there? 5. You think I want to compete with them at 2 5? No. I go open at a different time now. Yeah. See that? And then he said, Ah, in our bar, a lot of us are there. And this masala, like this yellow thing called mustard. And I put it in my tent because they like mustard. Obviously, I sit in front of 7-Eleven and mustard is only 4 ringgit, 24 cents. I buy mustard, we put over here and they sell more burger and more top. Because I'm pang, that masala, that's all. That's all? Yeah, that's all. So you see how innovation can be as simple as it is? It's about putting value to your customer. For Scully, it was simple. It was taking open source technology, which licensing costs always cost 40-50% of the time, take it out, charge services on it, which is around the same price, and I get price competitive solutions that works, world class. Who doesn't want to pay 50% of the price and you get the same Mercedes? Or the same BMW? Same thing, simple as that. That's innovation putting value, 
something to your customer. So take that, and it can be as simple as own burger. And that's what we teach entrepreneurial leadership in Scali. You know, some of the things that are so simple and can sell a lot of things. Okay. Secondly, uh, how do we scale up? Well, you don't have, uh, we have big, I think the same goes, uh, big plans, uh, but small steps, and that's what we really did. We just said, look, you know, we want to grow 10 to 20% a year. So what's our target? What's our cost? How do we go into the market and work backwards? Uh, because I was an investment bank, and the accounting principles always work backwards. What number you want, okay, we will do that. <laughs> so but investment, that's how it's, it's, it's taught. You work backwards, and that's how we look back and say, look, have the end in mind, look back. Don't think about big. Don't think about big as big as Facebook. Don't think about being as big as IBM. But think about putting the best value to your customer. For one customer will be five customers the next month, 50 customers today, and soon you know you've got 5,000 customers. And that's what we did back together. We made to make sure that 38 ringgit that they pay us, to them it feels like it's 30,000 ringgit a month. Every time they call, we're there. Full force. Okay? When Indonesians were attacking uh, our Malaysian websites, many times, okay? You know, we hire an extra security team just to look at Bangladesh's website, Kazana's website, UPS website. So we want to take care of that value. We don't care about cost. We want to make sure our customer is happy. Full stop. That's how you scale up. Don't think about money. Don't think about billions of dollars. Okay? Don't think about that. But think one customer at a time and focus on growing that 20%. You have five customers now, focus on making eight customers happy in next year. And so on and so on. Remember, good companies don't come about overnight. Okay? Uh, the likes of Google, Yahoo, whatever, Facebook. Uh, is uh, one in a million, okay? But the good companies that stand, you can see them still around. They are hundred years old, and they keep on growing. Okay. Now the third question was Asian experience. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, one thing is that I think in terms of organization wise, in terms of the organization culture and structure, I think we're very much well advanced rather than. Um, uh, compared to these uh, organizations. But the export-oriented organizations, like, the, like I said, the Vietnamese IT companies that are oh, very, because they're export-oriented, they have to meet that standards. Okay? So they're very versatile and very dynamic. But the mass of SMEs are still grappling. But you see, these countries, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, they got a massive domestic market. They can sell at their company and still make a lot of money. But we can't do that, right? And that's how our organizations and our SME have been quite versatile and strong. But the question is that I still get friends who go, why should I buy your software and I'll buy a Mercedes? I can put the money into a new Mercedes. Huh? They will say, ah, that's the option of the SME entrepreneur. Buy a Mercedes, looks good. Or, you know, put your software, buy your software. Okay. or get another salesperson. These, these are the options a lot of our SMEs are. And it's, it's also the same. But in terms of organizational wise, I think that. But I mean, I just want to add about organizations being innovative and so on. We have this issue. It's really about competition. If we, if an organization is complacent, they won't be innovative. Survival will push everybody. But too much Competition is also not good luck. I mean, you've got airline industries where every 10 years you have to build an airline company. It's not just for British Airlines. Look okay, at United Airlines in the US. Okay, British Airways, Qantas. All the time because competition is so much. But who makes the money? In airline industry. Can you name? Any ideas? Boeing and Airbus. And a few of them, Okay, so too much competition is not good, but competition at the right amount, okay, makes everybody innovative. 
for Scali, for IT industry, like us, I have to fight with the IBM and Microsoft. That keeps me awake every night, going asking everyone to say, how do I fight these guys? How, what, they've got like billions of R&D, okay? They've got thousands of sales people. How do I fight? So I have to fight on a different field. Next question. Next question. Um, Assalamualaikum and good evening everyone. My name is Muhammad Sharil Majid, a student from University Technology Petronas. Now I'm doing an internship at an oil and gas company here in KL. Um, my question comes from my experience within my internship period. You see, I have met with a lot of chief mechanics, you know, in oil and gas. In order to get to that position, you must have value. You must have knowledge, you must have experience. And these chief mechanics are super people, they can just tell what's wrong with an engine by smelling at it, you know? <laughs> so, the problem is, all of these chief mechanics that I know are foreigners. They are no, not Malaysian people because, you know, to get to that position, you need to undergo a lot of hardship, hard work, and I believe most of Malaysians, we are in our comfort zone, we don't want to go through all of those things. We just want to get a good pay and that's it. But it's different with these foreigners because they are in a do or die situation. So they have the will to fight till the end. And uh, the thing that worries me the most is that the trend of companies. You know, we are actually nurturing, training and teaching these foreign talents. Yeah. So in a way, what we are doing is that we are doing what you said is the worst case scenario. We are facilitating and helping these countries to catch up with us a bit more faster. And uh, you know, my question is how can we move our very own people so that they become much more proactive like these people? Do we need to put them in a severe situation like, you know, those people that they are in their countries, it's very unstable, then only, you know, they have this, this fight in them. Just because we are stable, does this mean that our people have become much complacent? We don't want to work hard anymore. What do you think we should do to help, you know, motivate our people to rise up to that level? That's all. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very good question. If you're asking, well, I have, I have five kids and I, as a father, I will ask myself, I mean, I, I don't want my kids to be complacent. I don't want my kids to be pampered. Um, one of the things is that I don't buy them expensive now. Things I give them proper money and you're supposed to then buy it. Um, from speaking about my experience, my my parents, because they don't want me to have a tempered life, they sent me to a boarding school at the age of 12. I think, I do not know, you recall when you were age of 12, you do, you do windows, <laughs> right? I sent them all the way to the other end of the world, alone, okay? A boarding school in the man. Okay. Who has worse is calendar, minus 40 degrees. Okay. Uh, but I think we need to teach our children that not to spin tea. And you know, I've seen how universities teach our students this memorization and spoon feeding. To be honest with you, they don't have the ability to find information themselves. And it's the journey to find information where they learn a lot. You learn how to use the internet, you go and talk to people in interview. But if you have to say, okay, this is the answer to the please memorize tomorrow, I will do the test. When are they going to learn? When are they going to learn how to speak to entrepreneurs, CEOs or managers if they don't go out and, and talk to people? And that's why we still have two students that are timid and coming out. So we need to change and how we teach and how we educate our next future generations. And that's, that's the start. We can't spoon feed people. In organizations like yourself, um, I've seen organizations that people don't perform and they still get two or three months bonus. I sit on a few boards of a few organizations and I said, I don't feel this company deserves, everybody deserves two or three months bonus. And if you do the 2080 rule, you should be rewarding two, three months bonus, or even eight, bon eight months bonus to only 20% of the staff. Why are you giving everybody? And that's 
rewarding complacency. If I don't do a good job, I just do my ordinary job, I still get two or three months bonus. If I if I do a really good job, I don't get anything done. So you are rewarding the slackness and you are this this uh, disintensifying uh, the the performance. Okay? So it's not helping out. Sometimes in our organization get structure and because we want to be very nice and very funny, we give this to a lot of people. And by that is pampering. And I'm worried this pampering attitude makes us very weak. Because we don't stress our stuff. And you know what? We're like I said, we're only 29 million people. How are we going to compete with the life in Indonesia that went to 150 million? Right? So we need to remember this. So this is the things that we need to Attitude in shaking this mentality of the spoon feeding pampering people. Okay, next question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yamulia Tengku, for sharing with us uh, your prescription in becoming an entrepreneur. Uh, I have three comments. Uh, the first one is uh, with regards to the gentleman's query whether you need something terrible to happen in order to be innovative. In fact, today we are having a conference called Science Technology Innovation at Royal Chelan, mm -hmm. uh, and it's organized by Academy of Science. And one of the key speakers had mentioned, in order to, have, to promote innovation, what you need is a man, a plan, and normally a crisis. Because when something terrible happens, then you put on the feet that you have to do something different. Yeah? So that's your uh, prescription. Uh, the two questions I'd like to refer is uh, Dato Mustafa Ong's uh, question to Yamule Tengku. What is, should business uh, get, uh, should government be involved too much in business? And your response was, not too much, otherwise you would affect the private sector. In fact, this was the same uh, response given by Tan Sri uh, Tony Fernandez during the World Economic, Islamic Economic Forum. He said, we want to do business, but government also wants to do business, but I think there should be a line where you do not compete with us. So maybe there could be a group of CEOs approaching the government that for the GLCs, we are not only looking at innovation in terms of technology, but they should have innovation in the business model. Because that is important. Because if you see the uh, report card of GLCs, some are emerging as winners, some need to be closed down, I think recently. So maybe that's one. Secondly, uh, with regards to uh, your comment that Malaysia should move up in order to gain the experience and exposure, as well as Dr. Mustafa's comment, talent card is not really advancing as how it should. My uh, recommendation. Actually, I've tried to push it so many times, but it was with much difficulty and I think not much effect. Because from what I see is, you know, in Indonesia during Habibi's time, when he was in uh, Germany, he stayed on to look at all the business plans, management and all that, he came back to build the industry. But our policy in Malaysia is, if you set students up, especially the government sponsored, you need them to come back immediately after studies. But now I think they are giving a leeway of a year or two. I think they should relook that. And with regards to talent call, I think it's a different business model they have to look at. Don't get the Malaysian who is so successful overseas to tie him back for a permanent job. That will not work. Because what we need to do is to look at how India did it. They have something called, uh, I think NIC, North Indian um, citizen, where a lot of Indians went to Silicon Valley, become multi-millionaires, they happily stayed there, but because of their loyalty to the country, they will come back only temporarily, short basis, to advise.